And we're going to be at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 today. A lot of you already know about that chapter. It's called the love chapter. And you go, oh, we're going to be talking about love. But it's not the world's kind of love, is it? It's a different kind of love. It's God's kind of love. It doesn't look anything at all like the world's kind of love. When you talk about love today in the world, you talk about how you're looking for the love of your life. You're looking for someone uh, to marry and you're going to go through life together and it's just going to be a journey of love on the love boat going all the way through your life, you know. But then if you look at your family, that's a different kind of love, isn't it? That's the kind of love where you love them because yeah, you were born into that family and they may have some problems, but it's the only family you have. And so you love them. But then your friends, you pick your friends and you say, oh, I just love being with her. I just love being with him until they do something wrong, until they say something bad about you. And then you don't love them anymore. Because you see, in the world, people tend to love people that love them back. The world says, I'll love you if you love me. Or I'll love you for what you can do for me. If you care for me, if you support me, if you give me money, if you make me the center of your life, then I will make you the center of my life. It's kind of like commerce. It's kind of like going to the store and buying something, you know. It's kind of like you go into the store and you say, I want this, and they would go, okay, well, that's going to be 20 shekels. Well, wait, don't you love me? I thought you are giving this to me for free. No, I only love you because you're our customer and you give us money. You give me 20 shekels and I will give you what you want to buy. You see, that's the way a lot of people think about love in the world today. A lot of people think that love is that way. They think that, well, I will love you if you do this in return. But if you don't do that, then I don't love you anymore. How many best friends forever didn't quite make it to forever? You know what I mean? But this chapter is talking about a different kind of love. This chapter is talking about the love that can only come from God. So let's go into this, and we're going to start reading. I'll read it to you, but follow along in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, and it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I am only as a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can understand all mysteries and have all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains. But if I don't have love, I'm really nothing. Then he goes on in verse 3. If I give everything that I have to the poor. Surely that's love, right? If I give everything that I have to the poor and even give my body to be burned. And don't have love, then I have gained nothing. Love is patient. Now he starts in verse 4, and he's going to describe some of the things that describe God's love. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. And it is not self-seeking. It's not all about you, you see. And it is not easily angered. Didn't say that it cannot be angered. It just says it's not easy to anger someone who is loving with God's love. And I really like this next thing. It says, and it keeps no record of wrongs that have been done to it. It keeps no record or no account of the wrongs that somebody is doing to you. Verse 6 continues, Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Love never fails. Let's read that part again. Love never fails. One more time. Love never fails. Understand that. That God's love 
will always accomplish what He sent it to do if we are faithful in loving others with His love. He says, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be quiet. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Now I only know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I am known by God. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned, I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things behind me. And so he says in verse 12, So now we only see a reflection in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know even as I am known. Now I'd like to say something just real quick before we read our last verse. In the old days, you didn't have mirrors like you have them today. The technology was not that good. They can make something with a shiny surface. They can make something that was brilliant and reflecting, but it did not have the light and the perfection that mirrors today have. And so when you looked in something, you couldn't really tell what was going on. Maybe you had some food in your teeth or something. You couldn't really tell that. You know, you'd be lucky to tell if you had hair, less well to comb your hair. Yeah, so those mirrors were not really very good in those days. So he's saying, now we're looking into a mirror and we see something dimly, but we really can't make out all the details. We don't understand it fully because we can't see the whole story. We can't see the whole picture. But one day he's saying, when we're before God, then we're going to see things very clearly. We'll understand more clearly. We'll understand just as He understands us. And so he ends with this verse, verse 13, and he says, So now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, I'd like to talk to you about this passage of Scripture that we read today. If you had been coming through the book of 1 Corinthians, and you had gotten to chapter 12, you notice that chapter 12 is talking about spiritual gifts. It's talking about people speaking with unknown languages. It's talking about people prophesying about future events. It's talking about people having the gift of translating these unknown languages or speaking in tongues. It's talking about these gifts of healing, these gifts of knowledge, these gifts of this, these gifts of that. And Paul was talking to the Corinthians because they had become a little proud in these gifts. Some of them had this gift. Another had this gift over here. And still another had this gift. And they were all the time trying to make themselves seem very important in the church because of the gifts that they had. Well, first of all, as you know, there's already a problem there because how can you be proud of something that you have if somebody gave it to you? If you worked it up, if you found out how to do gifts of prophecy and everything, then you would have a reason to be a little proud. <laughs> you would be wrong because pride is a sin. But you would have a reason to credit yourself for the work that was being done in your life. But Paul was saying, well, wait a minute. All of these things are gifts, right? Isn't a gift something that you receive? It's not something that you just work up in your life. It's something that you receive from God. So why are you proud about yourself? Why are you boasting about yourself? Because it came from God. And here you are boasting about yourself and your gift to somebody else that God has given another gift to. And you're saying, well, my gift is better than your gift. Or don't you think that this is the most important gift, the one that I have? And you're saying all of these things in pride, you see. So that's a problem. Because pride is a sin that God hates. 
He hates pride. That's why Satan was cast out of heaven. That's why Lucifer was cast down to the earth, was because in pride he tried to exalt himself to being even or equal to God. But pride in the church has no place. Pride among the believing brothers and sisters has no place. And that is a destroying type of attitude. It's a type of life that destroys what God is trying to do. So if you have something in your life and you're proud and you're boasting to your other brothers and sisters about what God is doing with you, then you shouldn't be boasting because God doesn't like that. He wants you to understand that all the gifts that He gives you, if He gives you a gift such as these, that they came from Him. If there's any glory to be had, it goes to Him. If you're boasting, you're trying to get the glory yourself. But God says, I will not share my glory with another. And so Paul, after he's talking in chapter 12 to all of these super spiritual people that have all of these super wonderful gifts, he's going to say at the end of chapter 12, he says, but I'll tell you, there's a more excellent way. There's a better way. There's a perfect way. Then he goes into chapter 13 and he starts talking about love. Wait, you mean if I have the gift of being able to touch somebody and they're healed of their sickness? That they're raised up out of a wheelchair? If I have the ability to forecast the future and tell you pro prophecies about what God is going to do in the future, or if I have the gifts to interpret an unknown tongue or to speak prophetically in an unknown tongue so that someone else can interpret, you mean to tell me that love is better than that? Yes, it is. You see, it was not through one of these other ways that God chose to reveal Himself to the world. But it was through love that He chose to reveal Himself to the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here today and you speak Hebrew, it's a Kichen Ohev Elohim et Haolam Arasher Natan Bado et Beno et Yechido Bikol Haman Minbo Lo Yavad Kivo Emsa Chaye Olam. God so loved the world. God didn't prophesy to the world to reveal himself. He did prophesy, he did give the prophets prophecies to utter. But when he wanted to reveal himself completely and perfectly and show them exactly what God was like in every respect, he became a man and lived among them. And that man, Yeshua, whom we call Jesus in English, that man, Yeshua, is the one who was the image of the unseen God. He was the exact image of God the Father. He told one of his disciples, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's the way it was. God became a man and he dwelt among us. But as we go through this chapter then, if we see that love is more important than all of these other gifts, then we need to be studying this love. How does this love operate? We've already said that it's different than the love of the world. Well, how does it work? Let's talk about the difference between the world's love and God's love. It says that love is patient in verse 4. We read it. Love is kind. Well, you know, in the world, love isn't always patient, right? The world's love isn't patient. It's only patient as long as somebody is loving you or giving you something. Otherwise, you're, saying, you're basically saying, well, what have you done for me lately? You know. But that's not the way God's love is. It says, love in God's love is kind. Well, in the world's love, many of the, much of the time, it's not really kind. I mean, you love somebody because they love you, but if they do something wrong, then all of a sudden, you're not going to be kind to them anymore. You're drawing the line right there. That's where your love ends. But God's love doesn't end there. God's love keeps being kind. God's love keeps giving. God's love keeps being patient. It says God's love does not envy. When someone receives something that you would have liked to receive, 
you don't get jealous about it. If someone wins the lottery and you say, I used to buy tickets at that store all the time. That should have been me. That person doesn't deserve to win the lottery. That should have been me. If you're saying that, if you're thinking those thoughts, then you're being envious. And envy is not a fruit of the Spirit. Envy is a work of the flesh. That's a work of the devil and of his, and of his uh, demons. That's not a work of God. There is no righteous envy, you see. It says, love does not envy. It does not boast. And we go back to that pride thing again. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. A lot of people in the world today, like we said, they only love people who love them. They only give to people who are giving to them. They might tolerate some things in life when you make a mistake here or there. But if you keep making that mistake, they're going to draw the line. They're going to say, you know what? I don't really like being around you anymore. I don't like loving you anymore. And basically what you're saying is, is because you've stopped being a certain way to me. You've stopped giving me this. You've stopped loving me, so I'm going to stop loving you. That's the way the world teaches. But the Bible here is saying that this love, God's love, is not self-seeking. It's not about you. It's not about you. Have you ever... There's an exercise that you can go through. Sometime if you try this, I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, try to go through 24 hours, one day, without saying the word, I. <laughs> I tried it once. It's a real test of the heart, you know, to see what you're really all about. I found out that before I made that rule, I talked all day. For that 24 hours after I made that rule, I hardly said anything. So I guess there's a message there, right? I was talking about me all the time. It was all about me. It was all self-seeking, you see. But love is not self-seeking, and love is not easily angered. You try to give a person the benefit of the doubt. You try to believe the best for them. They may prove you wrong, but even then, you've done wrong before, right? Maybe you can be a little forgiving for them and be patient with them and not go to anger right away, you see. It's not easily angered, but this last part I really love this last part. Love does not keep a record of things that are done wrong. We're all guilty, right? We're all guilty of that. I mean, there's probably people in this room that could look no farther than 20 or 30 or 50 feet away and list all of the wrongs that that person over there has ever done to them. She did this. He said that. I remember when this happened and that. And it's not just one thing. You've got a whole list. You've got a database on what that person has done wrong. Not only to you, but what you've heard they've done wrong to somebody else. But God's love does not keep a record of wrongs done. That's pretty cool love. I got to tell you, that is the love to aspire to. That is the love to try to get into your life. I got to tell you also, your life will be full of peace. Your life will be full of joy. And you'll probably live longer and with a lot less stress if you just let go of those things that somebody else did to you. In fact, maybe you say, well, I don't know if I could do that. You know, it said love never fails, but I mean, I'm trying to love that person. I just don't know if I can love them. But there's always people that only try to love because they feel like they have to. Now, the Bible says, well, you need to love with God's love. You know, uh, love others as, as God has loved you. You know, uh, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And you try to do that, you know, but sometimes you just want to obey the law. You want to obey 
the, the absolute writing of the law, but your heart is not into it. <coughs> Sometimes when I go to Jerusalem, I've noticed that some of the beggars on Ben Yehuda Plaza there, they have their cans and they rattle the shekels in there. And if they see a Yehudi, dot T, if they see a religious Jew coming down Ben Yehuda, they'll very quickly walk over to him. They'll get in front of him. Now he's trying to like find a way to turn and go around him because they know that he must give them something <laughs> and that he has to do charity this many times a day. And I have seen them that when they finally intercept this guy like a heat-seeking missile, okay, they get right in front, they shake that can, you hear these coins rattling, and they're looking at it. They're not asking. They're not saying, please, if you look at their face, they're going like, you know, gotcha, you know. And then I see the guy reaching into his pocket, and he's rolling his eyes and, and then walks on. There's no love in that. That's not real love. He's just doing that because he has to. You see? And the other person was just taking advantage of that. Where is the love in that? You see, love is a command, but it's not something that you do because it's a command. It's something that you do in your heart. We'll talk about that in a minute. But like we said, some people are really hard to love. Now, I know none of those people are in this room. <laughs> I always love to see how many people laugh. Most of the time, it's just about everybody, you know. When I say stuff... None of those people are in this room. Everybody here is so easy to love. Oh, you see that person over there sitting next to me? I've got to be careful not to point to anyone. Here. <laughs> you see that person over there, you know, sitting next to me? <laughs> I can't believe what a jerk they are, you know. It's incredible. You know, what an idiot, you know. And, and did you hear what they did? Oh, yeah, well, let me tell you about what he did the other day. Did you hear what she did? Do you know what she did to me before? And all of this stuff, and everybody has problems. And some people say, well, I tried loving that person before. But every time I do, they just throw it right back in my face. They just don't appreciate the love. They come back and they take advantage of me. So I'm not going to love them anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not what God wants you to do. He knows that it's hard to love some people. Maybe you should start think of it like this. Is that God loved you when you were a sinner. He loved you when you did not love Him. So He's expecting you to love other people in that way. To be patient. To be full of grace. To be full of mercy to be like your Heavenly Father. You say, well, I don't know if I can show that person love and kindness. You know, and sometimes it's just so hard. I mean, they're in my face. They're doing this, and I'm trying to be kind. And, you know, listen, I heard someone say, love and peace start with a smile. Just smile. Now, I don't mean one of those smiles to where you're, they're in your face, and you're smiling, going like... You are an idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've never seen anybody as crazy as you. <laughs> you know, it's not that. I mean, you really, in your heart, you're trying to love them. You're not just trying to keep a law. You are trying to love them with God's love. So instead of thinking about how bad they are while you're trying to smile, what about thinking about, well, you know, this person's really hard to love, but I remember some things I did in my life, too. And I know I was really hard to love. So I'll forgive them. They didn't ask me, but I'll forgive them. They're not really showing an interest in me having compassion, but I'll show them compassion in the same way that God showed me compassion and mercy before I asked Him. That's how we'll do it. And that way it becomes kind of a game. And they say something and everything. You go, I understand. Well, listen, you have a nice day. I'll be praying for you. Okay? And you just go off whistling down the street. Okay? If you can whistle. So, <laughs> so you cannot be with that person all the time. It's not going to be an argument that, or a debate that you want to be there all the time. And you can't be there with them all the time. But I'll guarantee you something. If you love someone in return for them doing you bad, God is going to be there with them. He's going to be talking to them in their hearts 
a lot about what happened. Have you ever noticed that when somebody throws a punch in a fight and the other person throws a punch in a fight, before you know there's 557 and a half punches thrown and nobody remembers who started it. It was just, as we say in Hebrew, a balagan. It was a mess. It was a, a fight. Okay? And it was a big mess. But if someone does not fight back, you can block, guys. If someone is not fighting back, if someone is turning the other cheek, if someone is talking bad about you to everybody else, and when everybody else asks you about it, you choose not to talk bad about that person, then everybody else starts thinking, you know, well, at first, I heard this guy saying these things about you. And I thought, well, that's really bad. Why would you do that? But then the more I've seen that other guy, and the more I've seen you, you're never saying anything bad about him. He's the one saying things bad about you all the time. And then they say, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. In fact, I don't believe his story anymore. I believe you because you're showing God's love. So sometimes just not fighting back like that will win the debate. There is no intellectual argument. There is no theological argument. There is no debate argument against love. Love never fails. Love always wins. You can't fight love. You know, I, I remember hearing this story one time. I, you know, I saw this, you know, this, this guy is, is arguing to somebody because they're a believer and everything. And they say, you know, well, it's okay. Don't worry. You know, I'll pray for you. He says, no, don't pray for me. Don't pray. You know, don't pray. I don't want your prayers. He goes, well, I'll pray anyway. Hey, don't pray for me. Okay, have a nice day, you know, and go on. Some people know that God is going to be speaking to their heart later. And they don't want to go through that. They'd rather have their fight with you. We have a very dear friend who we've known for many years. She used to work in some of the ministries that we did here. And she wasn't a believer. She was a Jewish lady. And she came because she really loved the work that we were doing. And as we kept talking to her and everything, she, she understood the gospel, but she still did not believe. And then one day after about three years, she came back into the place and she was smiling. She had this big smile on her face and we asked her, okay, this is not what you usually do. What happened? And she goes, you'll never believe it. And she's smiling, this big smile that she never smiled with before. And she's going like, it's kind of like, you know, ask me. <laughs> ask me. You know, and so we ask her, okay, what happened? And she goes, well, I was real tired and I went home and I laid down to take a nap. And as I laid down to take a nap, I closed my eyes for a little bit. But then I opened my eyes and there was a man standing at the foot of my bed. He was standing at the foot of my bed, smiling at me. And as I looked at him, he just put out his hands like that. And she said, I knew instantly at that moment that it was Yeshua. I knew that it was Jesus. And I believe now. We weren't there. We weren't debating with her. We weren't arguing. We weren't trying to win an intellectual argument. We were just loving her. And in the meantime, God was speaking to her heart and doing these things. He didn't need us. All we have to do is just do what He says, and He'll take care of it. You know, the love is something that when you're born into this world, you have the DNA of your father and your mother. Okay? If you're adopted, you've got somebody else's DNA. I have adopted daughter too. But after a while, she grows up in our family and she learns the ways that we do things. So you could say she kind of like has her own like emotional DNA from us too, if you will.
But when you're born, reborn into the kingdom of heaven, I like to think of it like you get some of God's spiritual DNA. I'm not saying there is a such a thing as spiritual DNA. I'm just saying it as an analogy, as a metaphor, that when you're reborn into the kingdom of heaven, you get some of your heavenly father's spiritual DNA. His spiritual DNA gives you the ability to love other people in the way that he loves them. He loved them before they loved him. He loved them before they sought to have his forgiveness. He loved them before they called on him. He loved them because he saw that there was going to be a big problem down the road and that they would not be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven because of the sins in their lives. And so he went forth and he made the way for them to come into heaven and stand before him and that their sins would be forgiven and covered. He did that before anybody asked him to do it. That's the way he wants us to love other people. Loving others is the one thing in your life as a believer that proves that you are a believer. It's not something more that you have to do on the list. It's part of who you are. I know that you're a believer if I see God's love operating in your life. It's not something that you have to work up. It's not something that you have to plan. It's a natural thing because once you are reborn into the kingdom of heaven and you now have your heavenly father's spiritual DNA, it's just something that the Holy Spirit in you is going to be seeking to do with other people around you. Love is something that you do. And when you are loving with God's love, it is the one thing that proves that you are His. Like we said, Yeshua said, By this will all men know that you are my disciples. He didn't say, if you speak in tongues. If you can heal the sick. He didn't say, if you pray longer than anybody else. If you pray beautiful prayers. He said, by this one thing will everybody know that you're mine. Because of the clothes you wear. Because of the way you fix your hair. Because of what translation of the Bible you use. He didn't say any of that. He said, by this one thing will all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. Oh, wait a minute, Lord. Isn't there something else? I mean, I'm really excited. I'm really pumped up. I want to work for this. I want to do something. And he says, go and love in God's love. <laughs> okay. But as soon as I get back, you're going to give me some more stuff because I'm really excited about this. And just love. Just go and love in your heavenly Father's love. That's what 1 John seems to say about the love of God. He says in 1 John, Chapter 4, verse 7. I'll read it to you. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God. It's that spiritual DNA again, you see. And he knows God. But whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You want to see the definition of perfect love? Look at God. Look at what He did for us to save us. He came to us when we weren't asking for Him. He forgave us before we asked. He gave us a Savior before we knew we needed to be saved. He says in verse 9 then, This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Yeshua said, Greater love has nobody than this, than that He lay down His life for His friends. But some people are not only not willing to lay down their life, they don't even want to talk to that other person. You see? And you say, I just don't know how to love somebody like that. And I think the key is you just need to sit back and think, about what God forgave you for. And if you really think about all the things, start listing some of the things that God forgave you for 
in your life. Then as you look up from that very, very long list and you look at that other person, now it's a lot easier to love them even though they've done things wrong to you. When you realize what God has done for you, it becomes easier to love others. Jesus said, he who is forgiven much loves much. That means not only loving God much, but also loving others much. It makes you understand the love of God a lot more when you realize what He has forgiven you for in your life. This is the one thing that happens in our life that makes us know that we belong to Him, that you love one another. Do you love others with God's love? Maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe you don't understand what we're saying here today. Love, I've heard about love. You know, the Beatles sing about it. You know, all you need is love. <laughs> they were right, actually, but they were just talking about the wrong kind of love. All you do need is God's love. And when you belong to Him, your life is changed. It's not only going to change your life. It's not, going to, it's not only going to change the fact that there is now peace in your life. There's joy in your life. God is going to be taking care of you. There's nothing that's going to surprise Him. He's going to direct your steps. You're going to say, Father, guide me today, and He will lead you to the places that you need to be. He'll lead you away from the places where there's harm that can come to you. He'll lead you away from the bad. He'll lead you into the good. And He will take care of you in everything that you think and say and do. That's the kind of love that He has for you. So when you have that kind of love in your life, you're very appreciative. You're very thankful to the Lord that He loves you like this. But if you're here today and you don't know the Lord then maybe you're just saying like, I'd really like to have a Heavenly Father like that, but I don't know Him. I don't know. What, what do I have to do to get that kind of love? What do I have to do to know that one who loved me when I was so unlovable? Well, the Bible says it's really simple. That if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Four words, you will be saved. You don't have to worry about the 613 shalosh esrei mitzvot, or commandments, the 613 commandments. God simply says, I took care of all that for you. The righteousness, you don't have to worry about the righteousness of things that you do. In fact, your righteousness, the Tanakh says, is like filthy rags to me. He says, but I will give you a righteousness from God that will truly make you pure, make you cleansed, make you free from sin. And once I give that to you, you'll be free. The world will never be able to take your peace away. You'll have it inside. You might be in the middle of a storm, but you won't be worried because He will be with you. That's the kind of love that He gives if you believe on the one whom He sent. You simply believe. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would never perish, but have everlasting life. You can have this love in your life. Just pray after what I say. Just repeat after me. Just say, Lord, I do want to be forgiven. I do want peace in my life. I do want joy in my life. I don't want to live like an animal, Lord, in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. I, God, I want your love. Please take my life and make it into something wonderful for you, Lord. I've been darkness before, Lord, but now I want to shine a light to show people without love how much you love them too. Take my life. I believe in your work on the cross in Yeshua. And I ask you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. B'shem Yeshua, and imit palel. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The Bible says that if you prayed that prayer, it's a simple prayer, but God heard every word. You didn't even have to say the words in your heart. He heard every thought. Does that surprise you? He made the mind. He made the brain. He made the heart. He knows you inside out. He heard it. 
Give him time. You're going to start seeing changes in your life. Maybe not a lot the first day or two, or, but after weeks, after a few months, people that you know from before are going to start coming up to you. They're going to start saying, like, something's different about you. What happened? And then you're going to start being a light to others in darkness. You're going to stop being a taker, and you're going to start being a giver. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's the way your Heavenly Father is, and now that will be in your spiritual DNA. Amen?